One of the major changes in strategy at both a corporate and in a government level is a switch from a focus on robustness, i.e. trying to prevent failure, to one based on resilience, which is all about early detection and fast recovery. Now, of course, all of this is linked to risk, and risk has traditionally been assessed on the basis of a bell curve or a Gaussian distribution, to be more technically accurate. And I've showed one half of a bell curve here. And the basic idea is I plot all of the sort of things which can happen, ideal probability assessments, and anything which falls within the bell curve I should be expected to manage for. Anything which falls outside of the bell curve is called a black swan in popular vernacular, or otherwise known as a low probability high impact event or an outlier, something which is so unexpected or so unusual it's not reasonable to expect planning processes to handle it. Uh, there are two problems with this. One is so-called low probability events seem to be happening more frequently of late and there is a reason for that which is that in nature we more frequently see Pareto distributions not Gaussian distributions. So topically here I've actually produced a double log scale of earthquakes, um, a double log scale of showing size against frequency and as you can see this produces this straight line called a power law ignore for the moment the slight deviation at the top left that is significant and we'll come on to that on the next slide. Now power laws occur naturally if I take virtually anything so for example there are a large number of fleas, a small number of elephants, a large number of villages, a small number of cities. Effectively anything where I do a double log scale of size against frequency I get these power laws and if I take some liberties with statistical representation and overlay a Pareto distribution on my Gaussian model, I get what's called a fat tail, and it turns out that my so-called low probability events actually have a medium probability, and that dramatically changes the strategic agenda. The simple number of events I would have to plan to manage is so high that I can't possibly do it, and therefore I have to accept that a degree of failure is inevitable, and if I treat this properly, it's actually an opportunity. The whole point about resilient strategies is to focus on early detection, possibly even detection prior to actual failure, fast recovery, and then the opportunity, early exploitation. If you look at this, this happens naturally in entrepreneurial environments like Silicon Valley, where a large number of people are actually running multiple experiments. Some of them will succeed, even though a large amount fail. The issue for large companies and for government is how to get that ability, that entrepreneurial um, capacity to early exploit new opportunities, to early exploit traditional industry failure, how to get that into large organizations. And the resilient strategy is all about that. So if we take the Pareto curve and now look at it again, uh, what I've done here is I've made one change. I've still got the double log scales but I've increased the size of the events as they move to the right to give an indication of the higher level of impact. Now on the left hand side of the model, that anomaly I pointed out earlier, what I've got is a large number of probable or possible events and a large number of actual events. So because I've got a large number, large number it's a many-to-many -many relationship and therefore a Gaussian statistical universe works quite well. And I can reasonably be expected in that universe to produce probability assessments and almost take a deductive approach to reasoning. I should be able to say if we do this it will produce such and such a result with a very high probability of success. That's the world we'd all like to live in. Unfortunately a large parts of our environments are not like that. As I move into the borderline between Gaussian and Pareto universes I switch from probable to possible. I, there are a range of possible outcomes and it's difficult to assess them in terms of probability. This is the world traditionally addressed by scenario planning where I use techniques, for example, such as Delphi method to gather large numbers of expert opinion. I do a forces and factors analysis. I end up with a 2 by 2 matrix which actually covers the range of possible outcomes and then I produce scenarios for the four corners in the center. And then again, I've applied due diligence. I've actually produced effectively a series of plans that cover the range of events that we can assess as possible. The trouble is that experts become entrained. We can only assess probability based on what we think, what we understood from the past. We can do all sorts of stuff to be very creative on this, but fundamentally, as I move to the right, we're dealing with a range, a huge range of events or possible events, with only a small number of actual ones. 
and many, many of those events are fully plausible. They could all happen, but I can't possibly manage for all of them. So I move from probable to possible to plausible as I move from the left to the right-hand side of the scale, traditional methods increasingly fail. So whereas in the, their domain of the probable and possible, I can use hypothesis-based research methods, focus groups, questionnaires, I can test my hypotheses, I can use different groups of experts to create a comprehensive range of hypotheses that I can test, I can apply inductive reasoning, which is otherwise known as case-based approaches, I can see what other people in similar circumstances have done, what worked and what didn't work, and from that I can create industrial strength recipes which will allow me to manage on a reasonably consistent basis. However, as I move to the right-hand side, the universe has now changed. Hypotheses will blind me because I won't see the things that fall outside the bounds of my or my own staff's imagination, and that's where the real shocks, the real black swans, are going to come from. So this is a world of nil hypothesis research. I can't afford to go in with any hypothesis whatsoever. And the reasoning method is abductive. Abductive logic is about making connections between things, seeking the most coherent and economical explanations. It's sometimes known as a logic of hunches. It's that ability of human beings individually and collectively to sense or see a connection before it's available through conventional scanning methods. The trouble is, for this to really work, a human has to be activated to a heightened state of awareness. Um, in a heightened state of awareness, we see things we didn't, wouldn't otherwise expect. So let's take a classic case on innovation, the discovery of penicillin, where an accident produces the result. Somebody forgot to wash their petri dishes overnight, so an unusual mold grows. But Fleming is in a heightened state of awareness because he's in that field, and he realizes the significance yeah, of what actually happened as a result of which we get penicillin. So this is all about switching from a world of prediction to a world of how do we trigger anticipatory awareness when effectively the threat horizon or the opportunity horizon gives some indication of unusual or black swan type events. Now this may all sound hopeless but one of the great things of the current world is technology at last as it's becoming a useful tool rather than, to be honest, what it has been for a couple of decades, a fetishistic device, allows us to hugely augment human intelligence by, for example, whole-of-workforce engagement, whole-of-citizen engagement, to actually capture and sense patterns in huge volumes of data. Uh, one way we do this, for example, is this, which is called a fitness landscape, in which the hollows represent stable parts of an ecology, and the peaks represent instabilities, which are both threats and opportunity. That particular model has several hundred thousand data points in it, for example, and the yellow dots represent anomalies or things we probably need to pay attention to. And again, you can see here the data, the decision maker, is in direct contact with the raw data, a process called disintermediation. So in this world of nil hypothesis abductive reasoning, what becomes important is we can see the vectors or the possibilities of change. We move from attempts at predictive models, the classic systems approaches of boxes with arrows with probabilities on them, into whole-scale system simulation, um, and also into whole of population modeling, um, some of the work we do here in Cognitive Edge. So the basic principle here is to understand the evolutionary potential of the system rather than how to engineer it, how to determine an outcome. We need to understand in which directions the system can evolve and in which direction strategic surprise can arrive. So our principles of managing this space are very simple. First of all, we manage problems obliquely. Now, there's a wonderful book by John Kay called Obliquity, which gives loads of examples of whereby trying to solve pro small problems around a major issue, it becomes easier to solve the major issue itself. I would call that the switch from fail-safe design to safe-to-fail interventions, multiple safe-to-fail interventions, using distributed cognition, whole-scale human sensor networks, real-time modeling in which the system feeds back in real-time as can be done with fitness landscapes. So you can actually see the patterns of emergent potentiality opening up. You can assess which are the most plausible, and you can either seek to prevent or seek to exploit the things which happen as a result. The future belongs to companies and to organizations and to governments who recognize the need for strategic agility and with that comes an approach based on resilience rather than robustness.